work I'm presenting today is actually the work done uh, in large part by my PhD student, Gianmarco Fabiano, who did, who did really wonderful work implementing these artificial neural networks for simulating the Heisenberg model. But also, Obama, who helped with uh, analytical studies to understand what is going on. So, um, I think in the context of this conference, my approach is uh, applied. I'm very much uh, interested in using these uh, artificial neural networks to ask some specific physics questions and just to explain uh, the motivation. So this is the first part of my talk, motivate why I'm so much interested in this Heisenberg anti-ferromagnet. And then with that, I will start in a minute. And after that, I will show some benchmarks for dynamics and also some results in which we think we found some new uh, results that we so far could only obtain with these little quantum states. So the motivation is in principle quite simple, so simple-minded in the sense we just want to understand how can we transport information on a very fast time scale. So here you see a very abstract image, so uh, which shows a diagram there with on the left side, side some input, on the right side some output, and there's a medium in which this information propagates. So I think all of us are using such kind of concepts every day because we're all using computers and the electrons are there, the carriers of the information. So we also, you also may know that you have to charge your computer a lot if you're using a laptop or if you think a bit about um, data centers, they are consuming huge amounts of energy and that's simply because this transport of electrons is not ballistic but diffusive. So people in many fields of research try to find alternatives and one alternative is to use the spin of the electron and not the charge and not only the spin itself, not spintronics, but really to use the wave nature of magnetically ordered systems, which are magnons, and this is a field which is called magnonics. So um, then the question is, how can we push these magnonic fields to the ultimate regime? So what is this ultimate regime? Sometimes we call it colloquially this edge of space and time and magnetism, with which we say that we're looking at the smallest possible length scale. So this is the wavelengths of these magnons are ju just approaching the distance between two spins. And then these magnons have an energy scale of the exchange interaction, with, which is typically between 10 and 100 milli electron volts. And because this is wave nature, the propagation can be very fast <laughs> and with very little energy dissipation. Then, okay, you can take any magnet. What is the magnet which has kind of the record energy scales? So we don't have to look far. These are materials which are very well known for other reasons. The family of the cuprates, which are layered antiferromagnets, and the energy scale there is very high. And the excitation there can also be of very high energy. So you see here that in a material which is kind of a sister of this potassium nickel fluoride, you have extremely high uh, exchange interactions, which means simply that we need to look for the two-dimensional Heisenberg antiferromagnet. And can, we can expect kind of in real numbers, the group velocity of almost uh, one nanometer per femtosecond, which is kind of similar to what electrons have, but as we know in metals, they are very diffusive in their propagation. So um, that's kind of what we uh, are interested in. And this is also, this is an experimental image uh, on the right bottom here, where they do a Raman scattering uh, uh, measurement and they find these spin pairs excitations, so these pairs of magnons. This has also been studied in the time domain, so people uh, realize that you can interpret this as magnon squeezing or also as very special type of spin dynamics. Normally, materials where normally we think about some kind of precessional motion, but here we have longitudinal motion that we found can be interpreted as magnon entanglement. And the simple question is somehow can we uh, look, uh, can, can we understand what is the space time dynamics of this? Uh, uh, these magnon pairs. So the, conceptually you have a laser pulse which perturbs your exchange interaction and then you see magnons with opposite momenta which propagate in your system. So the minimal model is the square lattice Heisenberg model. The typical perturbation looks like this. So in, in the standard setup we perturb only the vertical bonds by a small perturbation and either we do this impulsively which is typically what you get for a laser pulse but we also um, to uh, the single quench, which is much more common, which I would call displacive excitation, but which is uh, the typical quench setup that is used in quantum antibody physics. 
Okay, but so this is uh, uh, my uh, direction onto this problem. Um, but I also would like to stress that this is just not only kind of applied, how, how can we fast find the fastest time scale? There is also a fundamental issue, so because <laughs> which relates this spreading of magnon, spreading of correlations in quantum many body systems, which is widely studied in one dimension from which we have a kind of quasi-particle picture which says that uh, yeah we have kind of light cone dynamics if we do a global quench or a single spin flip if we do a global quench we get the propagation of quasi-particles and therefore a, a propagation of spin correlations which is uh, uh, given by the maximum group velocity of the model that you study so, um, and in one dimensions, we also know that this uh, relation between the spreading of spin correlations is intimately related by the increase of the entanglement entropy. So from a more fundamental perspective, if we can study this Heisenberg uh, system, the question is, um, how is this relation between spreading of correlations and uh, 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 dynamics of entanglement in the two-dimensional Heisenberg model for which so far no real say, rigorous results exist or at least not results that you can accurately um, uh, and systematically improve. So this is where the neural quantum states came in. So of course this was pioneered as we all know by Giuseppe Caleo and Matthias Troia. And um, I'm here in a sense very, uh, have a very, very much physicist uh, approach to this uh, neural quantum states. For me, it's just a very smart variational uh, wave function. And uh, as usual, for a variational wave function, you have a reduction of, you have a huge uh, compression, say, of your uh, Hilbert space. So you don't need a full Hilbert spe space, but you just need only a polynomial number. And for a translationally invariant system, which is for solids most relevant, it's just linear with the uh, number of spins. And um, um, this particular representation is not limited by uh, an area law entanglement, which is of course advantages in higher dimensions and for time propagation. And also beyond uh, diagrammatic methods, which I also was using before to study these uh, Hubbard type models and Heisenberg antiferromagnets, you're not limited in the simulation time um, uh, for the memory that you need to store uh, in order to uh, time evolve your green functions. And I think the most appealing approach from the uh, physics point of view is that this is this variational method is much more unbiased than standard uh, variational methods. This was also nicely illustrated yesterday by the talk of um, Frank Pestrate, but there also was an earlier paper by Clark who uh, 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 investigated this link between tensor network states or more generally correlated product states and these RBMs. So um, this is the method that we will use. Um, and um, uh, well, of course, we will do ground state optimization and then we have to minimize this. And uh, we do that using the stochastic reconfiguration method, which we found to be most uh, stable and to give us uh, most accurately access to the lowest energy. And for the time evolution, we use similar as the, was presented in the talk before, the time dependent variational principle, which gives you this ordinary differential equation for the network parameters where you have this um, famous, I would say, uh, covariance matrix, which contains the derivatives of the wave function. And um, I just would like to say emphasize here, in the last talk, there was lots of emphasis that we have to kind of rewrite this S matrix in a different way, but for all the results I'm going to show today, uh, we simply used an iterative uh, inversion method without any regularization. So in our case, we could just solve the problem as it is. There was no need to go beyond the standard time dependent variational principle. Of course, we can talk about uh, more about that later. And there is also the talk tomorrow by uh, Damian Hoffman, with which we try to understand better where this standard variational principle works and where it doesn't work. Okay, so um, what did we do for benchmarks? Of course, uh, I want to emphasize here that um, Gianmarco did a wonderful job to implement this in uh, Julia, this uh, uh, neural quantum state, which, uh, th which we think is a very efficient tool, which kind of uh, is a hybrid uh, uh, language, which is, has the advantage of C++ and so on, like the high level <coughs> uh, uh, programming languages, so, such that it is really fast, but at the same time, it's 
is very intuitive to use. So you don't need uh, extraordinary programming skills. So you can also use this code if you like to and compare how well it performs against other implementations like netcat for example which is also publicly available and um, uh, in our case this is very to paralyze so um, i will come to it but so here you see some results first for uh, ground state optimization so here you see how the energy depends on the hidden unit density density for which we find uh, a very rapid convergence so this you see here in the top left and then if you extrapolate that back to the thermodynamical limit you can also compare it with the qmc and we typically find an error uh, on the order or better than 10 minus 3 and similar as in the pioneering work by giuseppe caleo we also found find that uh, for still a moderate uh, hidden unit density we are already uh, more accurate than the um, uh, matrix product state results Okay, so we, had, uh, we have the feeling that we have this ground state optimization well under control. So let's try to do some dynamics. And uh, because there is not much that you can do exactly for the two-dimensional Heisenberg model, we started out by comparing with this exact diagonalization. So just a simple four by four system. And um, um, as a first step, we started to look at this nearest neighbor spin correlation. So the black line here is the exact diagonalization result and the red line is the result that you obtain with the neural quantum states. And we see that for short times we get a rather accurate um, agreement with the, uh, or say overlap with the uh, exact diagonalization result, but at some later time there's some dephasing and also dissipation. There can of, may, of course be many origins of that. One is the just the time truncation error in the uh, integration of the ordinary differential equation. And another is of course the Monte Carlo error. But both we excluded and uh, by simply sampling all the states, so full summation and exact derivatives for this four by four system, we could do that. And also by systematically reducing the time step and then we found that actually the limiting error is just the uh, expressibility of the wave function. So, which means that if you increase this here, the unit density, you rapidly, and that was for us very uh, happy result, you rapidly approach the exact evolution of the quantum system. So uh, this is for four by four. Then we, of course, we are not interested in this system. We want to go to bigger systems and, um, to have some comparison, we started to compare this now with um, results from interacting spin wave theory, because in the end of the day, we were interested in this Magnum propagation. So at least in interacting, interacting spin wave theory, we know which modes to expect. So here we show some results of this comparison. So this is the integrated structure factor, which you obtain by Fourier transforming the uh, real space correlations, both in space and time. And then, you, um, we find, uh, of course, several peaks, not just a single peak as you would dominantly see this exact diagonalization or with a uh, four by four system. But you also see that uh, when you increase system size, you get multiple peaks, which eventually, if you would go to the thermodynamic, thermodynamical limit, will give you this uh, famous two magnum continuum. But uh, what is important here is that uh, using these um, NQS results, we are able to catch all the modes that we expect from this interacting spin wave theory. So it seems that it works well, uh, both uh, for small systems and also for big systems, although of course there we don't have uh, any exact comparison. So we don't also expect that uh, we ac get the same peaks that you see here. So finally, some comment of uh, on the accessibility of large systems. So in our case, so here you see an example of what we did to check how, large, how far we would, could go. So as expected, we have a quadratic scaling of the system size, uh, of the computation time with system size. So this is just the computation time for the single optimization step and for a typical number of samples that we use. So this is lower than also what we saw in the earlier talk on the Ising model where the sample size uh, uh, was in the order of a factor of 10 larger. What we always use as rule of thumb, which gives us um, uh, stable uh, time propagation, which follows actually for, for generic variation on Toccaro, as you'll see from this book of Pekka and Sorella, which were also speakers on this conference. 
if you use this rule of thumb test that the number of samples should be 10 times larger than the number of parameters, then we estimate that even like uh, order 1000, like linear dimension 30 for the square lattice is accessible on our local cluster with order 60 CPUs, just ordinary CPUs, no, no GPUs. Okay, so then now let's try to do some dynamics of this uh, Heisenberg antiferromagnet in regimes that we could not access so far. So um, to, uh, to get ready for that, let us see what we can actually can expect from the quasi-particles that we know that are in this model. So these are of course magnons. So what, <coughs> what are these magnons? So you simply bosonize your spin operators with the holstein pinokov transform and then you do a Bogoyuov transformation and then you get a Hamiltonian that looks like this. And for this perturbation term here on the right, you get this creation and annihilation of magnons of opposite uh, momentum and of the different boson pairs. So um, then uh, it's easy to solve this analytically by introducing some pair operators, which are kind of the bosonic analog of the um, uh, Anderson pseudospins. And that allows you to have a very simple solution of your uh, dynamics. So you start from the Bogoyubov vacuum and then you propagate this using in the interaction representation. And for very small, uh, like in the limit of small perturbation of the exchange interaction, you get a simple linear response like result where you see that you have a coherent superposition of the uh, vacuum and uh, the excited state with one boson excited in each of the boson flavors. So also from this representation indeed you see immediately that you are uh, these time dependent states are kind of entangled states at least in the uh, uh, bosonic basis. Okay so then we can solve the wave function that means we can also solve spin correlations and uh, <coughs> we have to think a bit more what can we actually expect from this, these magnons. So uh, here you see the magnon dispersion ar around some high symmetry axis and from this you see that if you think in terms of, the, of this quasi picture of uh, spreading of correlations we expect that the fastest spreading will be given by the quasi particles that have a momentum equal to zero. So um, that will uh, be the limiting factor for the propagation speed. And uh, then we can do some further qualitative analysis if we think about what will, can we expect for short range uh, spin correlations. Okay, this will then be probably dominated by the IK magnons and there are many of them because there are many magnons with um, uh, uh, similar uh, energy and high K. But all these magnons have essentially a, a vanishing group velocity, which means that you expect somehow that in your uh, dynamics of spin correlations, the nearest neighbor spin correlations will dominate and that they will essentially not spread at all. Whereas for long range correlations, then they, these are then subdominant and they are, um, their propagation speed is, um, uh, or their time evolution is limited by the maximum group velocity. So let's see if that's indeed the case. So here you see some results of, what that, of uh, a calculation that we did or that actually Marco did for a system of 100 by 100. And the top row shows the dynamics at short time. And indeed we see of course is first the uh, short range correlations. So this is the correlation uh, <coughs> spreading with respect to the center spin in the lattice. And we indeed we, we see some kind of anisotropic spreading. And this anisotropy remains present, but on the, on the whole, you have some kind of um, light cone-like spreading of, of, uh, of correlations in the system. We also understand this anisotropy simply from the spin wave theory. We have that to the leading order, we have just a uh, kind of uh, D-wave type symmetry of this spreading, which just stems from the way we excite the system always along this vertical bond. And that means that in K space on the diagonal, there is no spreading. If you then transform back in real space, you also have no spreading along the diagonal. So there, <coughs> there can be some corrections to that if you go beyond um, linear response, but this is what we see here, <coughs> nicely uh, consistent. Yeah, sorry, you have five more minutes. Then, um, okay, then I will hurry up. So we also estimated this uh, propagation speed and then we, we found that indeed this propagation speed is consistent with what you can expect from magnets. Then we went on to the neuroquantum states. Interestingly, we, we find the same um, uh, anisotropic spreading and uh, then we try to also quantitatively estimate how fast is this spreading velocity. So here we went to system sizes of linear dimension 20 
And uh, indeed, we see a similar light cone like spreading for the correlations along X. And what is now interesting is that um, here you see in the green line the expectation that you have from the uh, maximum group velocity. And these first points for which we expected hardly any spreading because they are dominated by magnons with essentially zero group velocity, we get even faster spreading than that you expect from the highest group velocity in the magnons. So this we found very interesting. At the smallest lengths in time scale, we find some kind of super ballistic because this is ballistic spreading, but it's faster than ballistic, and that which means simply higher than we expect from Magnus theory. So just to demonstrate that this is really um, kind of a consistent result, we show here results uh, that we did for various system sizes, and we find that even starting from uh, uh, 12 by 12 to 16 by 16 to 20 by 20, we consistently find that these first peaks are at earlier times than you, you, you expect just from Magnon theory. Okay, then uh, in view of time, I will uh, go a little faster for the entanglement. So what do we get for the entanglement? So we uh, can again think, what do you expect? So if you just, look at the exact expression for the entanglement entropy, you find that it's given in terms of uh, endpoint correlators in general, where n is the number of spins in your uh, uh, half divided system, so it's n uh, of the real system divided by two. And um, if you again uh, base yourself on the uh, Magnus theory, you expect again that the nearest neighbor correlations dominate in this entanglement entropy, which then would be more or less localized. So is this happening? So, of course, first again for four by four, indeed, we find that nearest neighbor correlations and Renyu entropy that we evaluate here just from the wave function have very similar dynamics. And then we went to bigger systems, and indeed, there we can still, because we have variation Monte Carlo, we can use this uh, smart trick developed by, um, uh, by Hastings and co workers, but Jamelko was also a speaker yesterday. Um, um, and then we find indeed that also for these bigger systems, the entanglement entropy is dominated by the nearest neighbor correlations as it oscillates. So it's not growing as we know from one dimensional system, but it seems coherent and it uh, uh, remains oscillating in time. So if it is really true, we should also be able to control this entanglement. So we show that indeed we can control the phase of the entanglement. So you see by per changing the perturbation protocol, we have up and down correlations, I like the phase is 180 degree different, and we see the same 180 degree difference in the range entropy, which further confirms that it's indeed dominated by the nearest neighbor correlations. And then, okay, if it's really coherent, we should also do some, be able to do some uh, amplification and um, uh, 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 destruction, so uh, constructive and, uh, interference and destructive interference. And indeed, this is what you see here. This is amplification by tuning the pulses, and you see similar kind of amplification in the entropy. And uh, in, we did this for many uh, uh, delays between the two pulses, and then we found that you get indeed uh, destructive and also constructive. So this reinforces really that this entropy is coherent and local, although of course these results are still for small systems. Doing larger systems and to repeat it and to confirm this result also uh, is completely free of finite size effects. So with that, I would like to conclude. So I hope I convinced you that these um, neural quantum states are highly efficient for studying unitary dynamics. And uh, I also would like to highlight the talk of Damian with which we collaborate to understand better uh, where this uh, uh, fails or uh, uh, where it works well. So we validated uh, for small systems, we validated against spin wave theory, and we can access very large systems. And I think we are one of the first that uh, can access previously uh, inaccessible physics in the two-dimensional Heisenberg model, or maybe it is accessible, but nobody tried to do it with uh, uh, more accurate methods than like uh, spin wave theory. And uh, from that, we found that actually the propagation of correlations is very different than we have in 1D. Dynamics of entanglement is essentially localized and coherent, and the propagation is nevertheless faster than we can expect from the highest group velocity of magnets. So with uh, that, I would like to thank again my co-workers, Marco and also Martijn, and of course, I also would like to thank some funding agencies. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>